Margo, uh, you and Jaina had worked on a project together to pull in photos from the members' libraries, right? How many, libra how many photos did you get? Fifty, sixty photos. So let's do a thought experiment. Now let's cut those number of photos in half, and choose the ones that are best that represent the best library space. So how would you go about doing that? And we can't go there. We can't physically go to that library, look around, see if the young adults are enjoying themselves. Right? We have to look at the photos. We have to look at the digital representation of the space. So that's the assignment I was given. I was offered. Uh, to go and, and figure out a way to look at a virtual representation of a library space and say, this one, based upon our rigorous findings, is, uh, has better qualities than that one. So how would you go about doing that? Right, so that's the purpose of, of my portion, very small portion of a very large grant. So that's what I want to talk about today. Um, I'm not going to try and get you to sign up for Second Life Avatars, because I think that's probably yesterday's news. So, but, but we did use some of that technology and it was very inexpensive and very useful for this process of creating a virtual representation of a real life space. So, all right, this is me. I'm a, I'm a full-time lecturer. I've been at uh, SLIS. Uh, how many of you graduated from San Jose State SLIS? So a good third to half the people in the room, right? There's about 75 people in the room here, so in about 25 of you raised your hands. Um, I've been teaching online since 1999 with SLIS, SLIS since 2005, 2006. And really my focus has been connecting 3D virtual environments and, and representations with learning systems. So I'm gonna show you like old news. I'm gonna show you Second Life circa 06, 07, the, the big hype time. So let me show you some examples of what we were doing with, uh, with Second Life back then. We're still doing some of the same stuff, but it's, it's quite a bit more uh, grounded now. This is, uh, this is more like uh, marketing. And my first stop, a virtual class at the Second Life campus at the School of Library and Information Science. Hello class, how's everybody today? So that's a reporter on the right hand side from PBS who came from the, the Quest um, Science uh, program, came and interviewed us and, and uh, right at the peak of that sort of bubble of, of uh, Second Life, is gonna, you're going to be able to do you know, everything. And this is uh, Lily Lewell, another hero of mine who's an incredible researcher at San Jose State, uh, a tenured faculty member who went to early tenure uh, because she's really, really quite good. If you have a chance to, to associate with her or take a class with her, I, I highly recommend. Introduce a visitor from KQED, and his name is Shiraz. Welcome, Shiraz. Hi, thank you guys so much for having me here. I'm doing a story for Quest on Second Life, so I'm really excited to be here. In today's class, we are going to do an exercise. You will break into pairs with one student playing the role of the user, another playing the role of the reference librarian. I paired up with Grayland Fairweather. In real life... See, they've got the headsets. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of uh, classes in our program are doing live video conferencing. This is video with a 3D component. It's the only difference, really. In real life, she's a graduate student named Robin, who helped build a lot of San Jose State's Second Life Island. She was kind enough to answer a few questions. What sort of books have you come across in Second Life? Uh, how many books do you own in Second Life? Uh, and do you have to pay library fines if you check them out for too long? <laughs> no. Uh, any books that are in Second Life, you can either buy them or get them for free. I have, for example, the collected works of William Shakespeare and H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. And uh, most many books that are in the public domain, people have brought into Second Life. So I have about 19,000 items and perhaps 200 books on me. What if I came up to you and, and asked you about like where I could find information on Second Life about aeronautics? Well, for, specifically for aeronautics, there is the International Space Flight Museum uh, in Second Life, or you can simply do a search uh, for places and look up aeronautics or flight. The strange but inviting space made me feel like I was in school again, where everyone was smarter and better looking than me. Well, at least in Second Life, I was able to opt for a full head of hair. And any other questions or thoughts or comments? I just want to say that these are the most attractive reference desk librarians I've ever met. All right, then. 
I love the dance, Robin. So. So that was sort of the uh, naive thought that we were going to be able to serve patrons in a vo virtual environment who were residents in a 3D setting. All that sort of fell away, became much more less, much, much less interesting. Um, but we have done two things in Second Life in, in uh, San Jose State that continues to bring students and, and have some positive educational outcomes. And the first one is a set of digital humanities courses that we've been running um, with different topics. So students come in together and uh, create the Renaissance of Florence or uh, pretend to be uh, Tudor uh, Shakespearean era uh, people or they coming up here uh, pre-revolutionary France in fall and students, 20 to 30 students, will come in and do some digital humanities um, content construction and role play. And it's interesting. Uh, they can do, let me get back in here, I'll show you some displays. So this is a, a very cheap and ineffective, or very cheap and effective way to do, sorry, to do um, <laughs> displays, to practice building displays and talk to each other about the arrangement of humanities content uh, in a physical space. So the students are arranging these things, record keeping in uh, Renaissance Italy. They're talking to each other about how they've arranged the information, how they're telling a story. You can see in the back there they've got the slides, and then interactive items around the edges of the, of the stage. So the students aren't experts at, at multimedia development or anything. They've gone and purchased these things and sort of put them together. So they're telling a story with uh, um, 3D objects, found objects but they get to talk about collection development and arranging spaces and things like that. So it's sort of training wheels. Here's another one. Uh, again, you see the slide uh, presenter on the left-hand side. Some very interesting um, um, uh, Renaissance era science tools on the right-hand side. Um, there's a prey. You can go over there and pray in the, in the left, have an animation for your, for your uh, avatar. Might as well use this, huh? Right here you can pray, have your avatar go and pray, and then uh, all these science instruments and the slide projector here on the left-hand side. So the students, each, each of the students gets one of these little lockers or carousels, and they can go in there and, and build a kiosk about art and medicine um, uh, with the nuns in Florence and in the Renaissance Italy. So that's one thing. We've done digital, digital humanities. We've used Second Life. We've had the students go in, and they've, they've really enjoyed themselves. and, and uh, done some interesting work. The second thing we've done is more of the, somebody mentioned Twitter, the, the social media aspect. So we have a virtual center for archives and records administration. We actually have a full second master's degree, uh, a MARA degree, uh, that's not an MLIS. Uh, and that group gets in there and, and has uh, conferences and presentations and they do poster sessions. And they really are about uh, promoting uh, this career option of archivist records administrators and doing it uh, focusing on cultural heritage. So that's two, two of the, the, the successful continuing efforts in Second Life. But this grant, the one that I'm uh, going to talk about, the, the work that we did with, uh, this is a student, Lori Harris, and also Julie Whitehead, who's graduated since, was to do, as Anthony described, surveys of hundreds of library spaces, videos of dozens, and now 3D spaces recreated from um, and I'll show you six. So we've taken those surveys. He sent videos to the librarians, about, what, about 20 uh, librarians and 20 young adults, yeah, uh, created uh, the videos. Then we took those and parsed the videos and recreated these spaces in, in a virtual environment. And the goal is to say, how do we know which, which space is better without having access to the space? So when Margo goes and grabs all those photos from all of your libraries, how do we know which ones, how can we, how can we do an evaluation of those spaces without actually going there? And that's what we've tried to do. <clears throat> so we uh, rebuilt six of them, and the point is to measure and analyze public commentary. And there's a precedence here, actually. This isn't something only done in, in uh, recently. Um, so here, here are some the virtual uh, representations. Um, these, I actually do not know where these libraries are. They are real libraries. I don't know where they are. Um, I think we just uh, an anonymized the video and, and didn't focus on the location of the videos, uh, uh, the location of the libraries that we were modeling. 
I'm going to show you specifically, if you can see the laser pointer, this area right here. There's a media room, and like uh, Anthony talked about, the trough. So there's a trough there in the window, and we're going to go, I'm going to show you some video going down around this space. So the key questions here, the key questions for my portion of this grant is, can we evaluate these spaces using simulation? Does it, does it help to evaluate them? Can we do it? Um, are there any advantages from taking the evaluators out of the actual spaces? So if we have all of the photos that Margo put together, showing them to a person and getting information, getting feedback from that person, is that helpful to separate that person from the actual space? kind of counterintuitive, right? You think you just want to put them there and they can look around and tell us how they like it. But there are actually some benefits from separating the people from the space itself. And finally, are, is there any new field of inquiry? Can we go, can we take this further and build on, build the literature in this area? So here's some precedents, here's some background. At New York uh, Law School, um, there was an island, the Second Life Island in 2006, where they created a 3D wiki um, and they rebuilt, how would you like to build portions of Queens, New York? So they rebuilt portions of Queens, New York and brought the public in to show them what the possible, uh, that possible neighborhood in Queens would look like. So that's something. Landing Lights is the name of the island and that was New York Law School. Another one much more uh, recent was a colleague of mine in Scotland, uh, Daniel Livingston, rebuilding, taking a class of, of students who were more uh, proficient in virtual environments and, and multimedia construction, to have them go in and look at urban regeneration. So we're going to plan the town of, of uh, Paisley, Scotland, and we're going to bring students in to have them sort of uh, build some straw man example of what the town could look like. And here's some screenshots from that. Um, they use different, all different platforms, so there's not just Second Life. There, here's Open Wonderland's another one. This is the high street for Paisley, the shopping street, and you can see that the students had built out. Uh, actually, this is pretty faithful to what was there. So it's possible to build out urban settings. Here's another one, uh, the town hall and abbey on the left, and more of the town center and war memorial here in a different platform. They even used, uh, they even used um, Minecraft. You're all familiar, if you, if you have a, an elementary school student, you'll know all about Minecraft. They weren't able to get the kind, of, the kind of look and feel that they wanted to out of Minecraft, so it wasn't as useful. So they had to, they had to take photographs of the space and then map it on their, their models. That's not possible in Minecraft. Here's another one, uh, the shopping uh, district there in Paisley as well. Okay. So that's some precedent. This is being done. Uh, it's not just our grant. People are doing this all around the world. Um, creating 3D virtual environments and representations and then trying to get feedback about it. So let me show you uh, one of the videos. Uh, uh, did, you didn't show a video, right, Anthony? So this is great. This is a video of uh, an adult. Uh, I believe it's in Idaho who has a teen space. And let me show you what, what, what he had to say. And when you were talking about what they were interested in, it, it kept ringing a bell because he talks about the collections and separation and the art and then Later on, I'll show you the same space with a teen narrator, and you can see her different perspective. Ten cents I started her. And since I started representing the library as a student, we have. Well, it looks like I don't have the adults, so let me let me just do the teen. This is the second of the three videos I was going to show. On the left-hand side, over here, you have the actual um, teen holding the camera, talking about the new space that she really enjoys. And you can tell she talks about uh, furnishing. She talks about how it makes her feel. You can get some of the, some of the uh, transcript and, and the verbatim, the talking that, from her. And then on the right-hand side, I also have the virtual environment, the Second Life virtual environment version of the same space. So actually, I'll probably play this try and play this twice, it's only a few 20 or 30 seconds, but so on the left hand side she's talking, on the right hand side is the virtual environment recreation of that space. Made this new room, it used to be the audio visual room for the handicap, but we have turned it into a really cool teen space. We have art that's been donated on the walls. We also set up three different computers for teens to research and study with. I think is very, very handy. We also have pretty cool uh, 
um, chairs here that are new along with a room to encourage reading comfortably. We also have we also have all of our animated graphic books located in here now. Um, we also have a TV here hooked up to a Wii with remotes that um, Okay, so there you get a good idea. On the left-hand side was her talking about the artwork, and the, uh, on the right-hand side you saw the Second Life materials that we'd rebuilt uh, based upon this video. So, One thing that we did immediately is take those videos and very meticulously slice them into one or two second pieces and look for every object that was in those videos. So we found over uh, nearly 800 data points uh, from six of the videos and we took uh, uh, a lot of screenshots, screen captures of those videos over and over and over again um, and created a spreadsheet that looked like uh, this and then you can see this is one example of that mural. So we were looking at everything in that space, each piece of furniture, each piece of media, each piece of electronics, um, uh, seating. And here's an example of the mural outside of that window. So this is a scene outside the second room, a window mural that said, be more, do more, live more, for teens. We have a screen capture, and then we also, um, if, we had, if, if it were a seating option, we also looked for that same seating option out on the web. So we tried to find the same uh, seat uh, for sale somewhere. So we were able to take that, uh, those six or seven different library spaces and slice those into 700 individual pieces to find all the different uh, parts of those. Here's some more conversions. You can see there on the left, top left is the real life space and on the bottom right you've got the, the computers. So we were able to buy the computers in Second Life and, and for a buck or two and, and place them in the spaces. All of the cabinetry and everything we found, um, pretty similar cabinetry, more computer workstations, those were very easy to find. So there's a whole catalog of things for sale in Second Life. A lot of things, we, one of the things we did is every single sign we could find, uh, we tried to recreate it and place it into Second Life so that uh, people who looked through the space uh, would have a good feeling for what was there. More computer spaces with uh, these walls, carousels. So it's just over and over and over again, getting, getting as many details as we possibly could uh, uh, exactly the same. So then we had a, a floor plan. Without looking at the library website or any of that, we went to the, the videos and created floor plans based upon the videos. And then um, also all of the textures, any carpeting, things like that. So, I've uh, got five minutes. The folks who we wanted to evaluate this was sort of a, a convenient sample of our, our own students. So we took our own students and had them go into Second Life with a possible uh, community of a couple thousand people. We had them go into Second Life with avatars, walk around the spaces, and then complete a web survey about the space. So we had 40 surveys completed, two rounds from May to October, See, the average age was uh, mid-30s, so older than our students. Our students tend to be mid to late 20s and 85% female. So the things that we asked them, we, we told them the kinds of improvements that, uh, that we were thinking of, and these are some of the things that they, they uh, were res responded to. This wireless connectivity, this was very important, kind of interesting, because in Second Life, I mean, there's no wireless connectivity, but the students the ones who went in thought that this was an important thing for the library to have. Event space, exhibit space, seating options. And this was one too, virtual merchandising in the library. So we asked them if that was something that they thought would improve the space and also academic technology. Storage, all these different things that we've, we offered them as an option. So, two this is probably uh, important, two, two main results here was that the age of the respondent didn't make a, a terribly big difference. You know, if they were younger, younger students or older students, it didn't make a, a very large difference. So here you see the, the red ones, the bar on the top. These are people 36 to 55. 
The ones on the, the bottom, these are our students who were 18 to 35. Generally the same trend line. And here you can see better wireless. Younger folks and older folks, they agreed pretty much with library space, you should have better wireless, generally. So not a lot of difference based upon their age. That was kind of interesting. I didn't expect that. But, okay, yeah, more of that. Okay, look at, look at this. This is the other thing. This is the point of not having the, the people go to the actual space. Because we can make, we can do A, B comparisons. I can actually tweak the space and pull out one single thing and have the same population look at that, those two, in an A-B, kind of an A-B comparison. So here's an example of a space that doesn't say teen over here on the right-hand side. That big mural, we just poof, blew it away. So we're going to evaluate these two spaces, and the only thing we're going to change is the fact that it doesn't say for teens. It doesn't say it's for young adults. So we can do that in this environment because it's simulated. That's a key point, of the, I think, of the presentation. You can evaluate a space, but can you evaluate a slightly altered version of that space? And in this case, you can. This is really, really, I thought this was really fascinating, that respondents who, who saw that big teen label in the window, they uh, were less interested in suggesting things like academic technology. They didn't think you needed more computers and printers for teens. If it were a teen space, they, they didn't think that was terribly interesting. Also, better wireless connectivity. Here, the ones who saw that teen space logo, now these are college students, right? These are, these are MLIS students. They didn't think wireless was so important for the young adults. But for the generic people, the people who saw a space that didn't say young adults, give me wireless because it's my space, right? As a, as a college student, as an as a MLIS student, I need, I need wireless. I need academic technology. So the, you really saw some bias in the reviewer, the person who was reviewing the space, based upon you know, whether, whether they thought it was a teen space or not. It's the same exact space. The only thing we did was take off the label. So you could see some bias there in the way that the, the, the MLIS students evaluated these spaces. So that's really interesting to be able to do this, to look at pretty much the same thing as real life. I mean, I mean you, it's the same structure, it's got the same decorations and everything. Everything's the same, except you're able to pull off, strip off that personality, the teen personality. And our students didn't think teens needed better wireless or that teens really needed more academic technology compared to if they thought it was a teen space. So that's interesting that you can take the evaluator out of a real space and start to see some of the bias there. So the key question, can we evaluate library spaces from afar? Yeah, darn right. And we can even do it with photos, too. I mean, Margot could have done it with her 60 or 70 photos, too. But it's, uh, it's more interesting and more hands-on and tactical, tactile if you can get in there and walk around with an avatar. Is there any advantage, and, and is there any advantage for separating the, the evaluators from the real spaces? And there is, because you can see some bias you're able to change that space in very subtle ways and see the bias of the evaluator. And does this open up any new fields of inquiry? I think it does. We have to continue chomping through the numbers and continue um, throwing uh, different populations into those virtual environments and getting feedback from them on what they think a good library space looks like. But I think this, this opens up some interesting stuff, so thanks.